Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 498 of the podcast and it is Friday 17th of July 2020 as I record this. So today I'm talking to Lindsay Barroca about how she manages her writing with 8 to 10 novels a year in multiple series and she shares a lot of tips about writing effectively in a series in order to please readers and also make more money because we do live in this binge consumption culture and the best love stories are often those that allow a deeper experience of character and world. Think of your favourite TV shows or books and you will likely find a few series in there. Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, The Walking Dead, Stranger Things, Harry Potter, James Bond, fill in your favourite here. (laughs) We even get annoyed now if a whole series is not available at once, and when a new series that we like drops on Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever TV show you watch now, we will binge it, and we might even wait until the whole series is complete before starting it so we can immerse ourselves. And the same is true of book series. So, Taking it seriously is important. Also, writing a series can make you more money. Since you have more books for a reader to buy, you can turn them into box sets in different formats, and it's faster to write with characters you know well. So we'll talk about all that, Lindsay's writing process, plus a lot of mindset and career things in today's show. A lot of it is relevant to nonfiction as well, so I know you'll find it interesting. In publishing news, Kobo Plus launches in Canada. This is really good, actually. I'm excited about this. Kobo Plus is a subscription service for Kobo, and I have nothing against subscription services. Obviously, Kindle Unlimited is a subscription service, Audible. There are many subscription services, but I do have an issue with exclusivity. (laughs) But Kobo Plus, you do not need to be exclusive in order to do it. So you can just go into your KWL account and turn that on. You can also access through Drafter Digital and some of the other distributors. So there's a whole article about it on the Kobo Writing Life blog, which I'll link to in the show notes. But basically, it's one of those things, if you're with Kobo, you will obviously want to do this. There's just no reason not to. So I've been in the program with the Netherlands, and that's been really interesting. So definitely check that switch and go and check. It probably is if you're already publishing with KWL. But I think the onward march of the subscription services for or ebooks is just going to continue. Certainly the dominant market for audiobooks. So yeah, very interesting times, but uh, good on Kobo Plus and Canada is obviously their biggest market. So hopefully that will mean more money for indies. Yay! Also interesting this week, Spotify makes another big move with Michelle Obama launching a podcast. And I can't think of a more different person than Joe Rogan, who was the last sort of mega deal they highlighted. And Joe Rogan is sort of ultra masculine guy. (laughs) And when I think of Michelle Obama in my head, they're just such different people. But that just shows you how seriously Spotify are taking podcasting and also how they are going after loads of different segments of the market. And they have also reworked the discoverability side this week with their new regional charts, trends and suggestions. Now, where have we heard of an algorithm like that before? (laughs) So the reason I'm including this in publishing is if Spotify takes audiobooks as seriously as they do podcasts at some point, they will be the killer app. I truly believe their suggestion algorithm is the best based on your listening experience. They've got me back into listening to music, which I haven't really done for many years. I found that Apple discoverability to just not be great. So I think that this is going to happen. I think 2022 is going to be the tipping point for Spotify getting into audiobooks. You know, I'm usually early on these things, but I I think that's going to happen. Hopefully, Find A Way will add distribution to Spotify at some point. That would be definitely in their end of the market. Fingers crossed that will happen. You can get audiobooks on Spotify right now as podcasts, like you can get audiobooks on YouTube. I have several. Successful self-publishing is free as an audiobook on YouTube, on my Creative Pen YouTube channel. 
But obviously you don't get the money in the same way as the musicians do on Spotify and on YouTube you get paid by ads if you have them or whatever. So it's the monetization model that's so important for audiobooks. So what we want to do is have audiobooks in there like music and get paid for the streaming. So really fascinating times. And again, I guess if you still haven't taken podcasts seriously in terms of book marketing, then I think it's only going to get bigger and bigger. And I'm getting pitched more and more and more by traditional publishers now for authors to come on the show. And a well-targeted podcast interview can sell a lot of books. So I think indie authors get really obsessed with paid ads and they are obviously effective, but content marketing is still a powerful force. It's also free and you can reach people with that sort of long tail. So I think having a bit of both is a good idea. So that's interesting. Also interesting is I mentioned Brandon Sanderson's Kickstarter last week for a leather-bound double hardback edition of The Way of Kings in a beautiful box set, an actual box. (laughs) The Kickstarter is now at 5.5 million US dollars with 21 days to go. And Dean Wesley Smith wrote an article about it expanding on why this is such a big deal. He says, What Brandon is doing is causing traditional publishers to shake more than the COVID pandemic. The ability of Brandon to do this is because he understands a level of contracts and kept the license for the hardback limited edition. Basically, Dean talks about The Magic Bakery. He has a book on it, a course on it. He's been on the show to talk about The Magic Bakery. And he says, on the face of it, the hardback limited edition would seem like a very small slice of the pie. So, for example, Brandon probably licensed ebook, audiobook, paperback, and normal hardbacks to his big name traditional publisher, whoever that is, but he's a well established, traditionally published author. But he kept the license for hardback limited edition, and this is about to make him quite a few million after all the fulfillment. So, Dean says basically, This is a reason why Chris and I scream so much. So Christine Catherine Rush, his business partner, wife, incredible author, editor, been on this show many times, one of my mentors. And I scream so much about holding your copyright because you just never know. Why is traditional publishing worried? Well, remember the monster deal Skullsy got for 10 million for 10 novels over 10 years or something like that. Brandon is getting that for a reprint hardback edition on one book. He didn't have to write a new word. He just used his license, his intellectual property that he controlled and offered something cool to his fans. What smart best-selling author now would think of giving a book away for the money that traditional publishers offer when fans can offer you a lot more and you get to hold all the rights for the rest of copyright? So selective rights licensing, my friends, that is what we're talking about. And obviously signing contracts with publishers and whatever is a normal part of the business, but do not sign all rights, all formats, all languages for the life of copyright, which so many authors still seem to be doing. This is a great example of keeping hold of specific rights and doing incredibly well with it. So good on Brandon for clearing the way for the rest of us. Right, so in my personal update, I did get my first words down for Tree of Life this week, Arcane number 11. I went on a walk and oh, just over three and a half thousand words. It's the basis of the first couple of scenes. They were quite messy, but it's a start. As I edited this episode today, I was like, OK, this is pretty meager compared to Lindsay Barocha. <laughs> but hey, we all have our writing process and comparisonitis is inevitable but we have to go gentle on ourselves. I also think there's something in my brain resisting the next project because Map of the Impossible launches this week as the podcast goes out. And I think my brain wants to tie up that trilogy and I have to get through the launch process, which, you know, I'm going to make some videos and going to do some ads and all the usual, send out some emails. And I feel like I need to tie the bow up on the Matt Walker trilogy before I move into back into the arcane world, different characters, different everything. I mean, really. And the Map Walker trilogy is a true trilogy. So when you get into the interview with Lindsay, you'll see she talks about how if you do have books that do have an overall arc over the series, they often have good sell through and good read through. And read through is something talking about paid ads that authors are pretty obsessed with right now, because it's quite hard to make money with just one book by doing paid ads, say Amazon ads, BookBub ads, Facebook ads. But if you have more than one book in a series and you can work out your read through, you can see how much money you can spend and still make a profit on multiple books. So I know this is important, but I have resisted it because everything I've seen just makes it way too mathsy for my head. 
And so I learned something interesting this week. I did a webinar with Nick Stevenson from Your First 10K Readers. And the webinar was on a zero to a thousand dollars a month. And it was aimed at going through what you need to do to set up a sustainable author business for the long term and make some money. And it was a very, very good webinar. And you can actually listen to the webinar at thecreativepen.com forward slash Nick Joe Replay. But what was great for me, and I got, I had one of those aha moments, which considering I've done webinars with Nick for like five years, <laughs> was really good. So Nick talked about how you can roughly calculate read through by number of reviews on a book. And this is fantastic. So reviews are a rough measure of sales. You know, we all know that. And if you do some rough calculations around number of reviews on the books, you can work out some kind of read through. And obviously it's very rough. So you should go on the conservative side. But I am now calculating read through on my series and I'm very excited. I'm also going to refer back to the interview I did with Mark Dawson. I've lost the plot in terms of timing. Could have been weeks, could have been months. (laughs) But the last interview I did with Mark... And I asked him about this read through with a perma free first in series. And he said, well, maybe just start it at book two. That's what I am doing now. I am actually running ads on book two because book one is perma free. Stone of Fire is perma free. Crypt of Bone is book two. So I'm running ads on book two and now calculating read through from book two to 10. So very excited that a penny has dropped for me. And to encourage many of you that obviously I've been doing this for so long, realistically 12 years plus since I first self-published. And I'm still having penny drop moments regularly. (laughs) So those of you who feel like, oh my goodness, there's so much to learn, there will always be more to learn. And that's why this game is actually fun. Because if we knew everything, it would just be boring and we'd want to move on. But anyway, I was very happy about that. So yeah, go check out the replay, thecreativepen.com forward slash Nick Joe replay. I've also been doing a big piece of work in updating my covers and metadata for Desecration, Delirium and Deviance, now called the Brooke and Daniel series, after my main characters, Jamie Brooke and Blake Daniel. And Jamie is a woman, and it was so funny because I often use these gender non-specific names. Like Joe. Joe, my name is the name I normally use, and I went with Joanna back in the day because Americans thought that Joe was a man's name. So it's so funny how these things come around again. And I had someone tell me that, Jamie, it's unfortunate that her name is Jamie because it sounds like a man. And I'm like, yeah, but it's also a woman. And what's the problem anyway? (laughs) But anyway, using character names is a common way to link a series. And I'm really happy with this. I feel like these books, they're so cross genre. They sit sort of psychological thriller, crime, a bit of horror, medical thriller. It's just so many different things. And you know, British detective, female sleuth. There are lots of different things where these books could sit. Anyway, we've redone the covers and I'm going to do a video on it at some point. And once I can actually prove that rebooting these books works, then I'll share more. Done the ebook covers so you can go and check those out if you want to and just getting all the print stuff sorted. So I should have all that done in the next couple of weeks. It's a really big job updating these things when you're wide but I will get there. And in fact, someone asked me the other day what I'm going to do now. I can't travel so much. And who knows when things will be more like they were or different in the new world post COVID. But I was like, okay, well, I may just double down on my own country, which is something unusual. Do more in the London, I say the London series, the Brooke and Daniel series, which is based out of London. And also I'm looking at the Scottish book that I've had on the back burner since my brother got married, which is like 10 years now. (laughs) So I've got an Irish one that I'd quite like to do. I want to pop over to Wales. So I've got all these ideas that could be based just within my own country. And for those of us who are travel junkies, we often spend more time out of our countries than in them. (laughs) So we shall see. I've also been prepping episode 500 coming up soon. It's taking a while because it has snippets of other interviews, but I want it to be a good one. So that is coming the week after next, which is exciting. Also wanted to mention Mark McGuinness and the 21st Century Creative podcast. I was on there talking about productivity and audio this week. And Mark also has two great interviews in this series. One is with a letterpress printmaker, which is just fantastic, book nerds that we are. And also John T. Unger, who I've kind of known of in the online space for like a decade, and he makes physical art and he's now making full size human anatomy mosaics. And both of these episodes on Mark's show, again, with the Brandon Sanderson thing, 
challenging our focus on digital first. I mean, digital first is fine, but digital only means that we're missing out on the beautiful physical objects. And listening to that show with John T. Unger, I was like, do you know what? I really do want to make something at some point. And I was thinking about bookbinding, as I mentioned last week, and really just considering what's possible. And very important for us as independent creators to think big about what we can do. And John's interview, certainly interesting. So just search 21st Century Creative Podcast on your podcast app. Okay, so we will get into other things in a minute, but I just wanted to read you the map of the impossible blurb because, hey, it's my show. (laughs) Okay, here's the blurb. A journey through the realm of the dead, a threat that will change the world. A choice that might save everything, or end it all. As natural disasters sweep Earthside, a mutant army rises in the borderlands, driven by the dark force behind the shadow cartographers. Sienna and the Map Walker team must use the map of the impossible to journey through the realm of the dead and face the nightmare at its heart. But when one of their number is taken and the team begins to break apart, each Map Walker must face their greatest challenge. Can the Map Walker team reach the Tower of the Winds before the shadow claims Earthside? Will Sienna choose Finn or turn away from the Borderlands forever? So there you go. That is Map of the Impossible. And if you like cartography and bath and compasses and split world fantasy, then go check it out. Right, so thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Brittany, thank you. Sent me a picture, me mowing the lawn in Pennsylvania, USA, with your podcast, my weekly ritual. Wow, mowing the lawn every week, that's pretty hardcore. I think we do ours like every three weeks or something. (laughs) Erin Compton in New Zealand. Hi, Erin, says, great interview. Now I want to write monsters. So that's fantastic. Andrew Piot says, love today's interview with Phil on monsters. Some great ideas in there for my own monster in the book I'm currently writing. Brilliant. And that was indeed a fun interview. So today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, which is great as they were also in the news today. And I did check my Kobo map recently and I have now sold books in 153 countries through Kobo, which is very cool. Thanks, Kobo Writing Life. So I'll play a word from Tara and Steph in a minute. And just wanted to reiterate, the KWL team are super lovely and friendly and you can always email them if you have a question. And they have a great podcast as well. Just search Kobo Writing Life on your podcast app. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. I did send out this month's Q&A this week and answering questions that people send me and also giving a bit of a personal update before it comes out on the show. So if you want some more behind the scenes, come and join the Patreon. Thanks to new patrons this week, Lucia Jacobs or Lucia, Lucia or Lucia Jacobs, Lee Evie, Nate Riles, Natalie Roberts, Ruxandra Tarka, Kelly Crowley and Glenn Nock. I really appreciate your support on Patreon. It demonstrates that you enjoy the show, you still find it useful after all these years and you want it to continue. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month. You'll get the extra Q&A audio. You'll also get 10% off my courses, which if you want any of my courses, like my author business plan, your author business plan, in fact, it's called, (laughs) which many people are finding useful, you can get 10% off just by putting a couple of dollars in. So support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from Kobo Writing Life, and then we'll get into the interview. Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Tara. And we're from Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors, and our team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. If you're looking for some tips on growing your indie publishing business, the Kobo Writing Life podcast is a great resource. We recently hit our 200th episode and wanted to highlight some of our favorites. For me, I really loved the episode that Stephanie recorded with Elise Daniels, who is Kobo's global audiobook merchandiser. Elise is a wealth of knowledge on all things audio, and she talked to us about the trends that she's seeing and promotions that she's testing, what worked for Kobo listeners and what didn't. She also gives her expertise on audiobook pricing, which is a bit of a mystery compared to ebooks. There's no real pricing rules and lots of room for experimentation. Her top tip was not to devalue your work. It really is essential listening for anyone with audiobooks on Kobo. 
In episode 200, we interviewed Kobo's CRM marketing manager, Christina Mendez, about marketing your books on a global scale. She provides tips for global messaging, the importance of being universal but not generic. She discusses the different tactic Kobo uses to market ebooks and audiobooks and explains how the Kobo recommendations algorithm works. My favorite part of the interview is when Christina shares her insights about what makes the Kobo customer unique. Spoiler alert, the Kobo customer is a voracious reader and they are constantly reading. They love to read long series and the most popular genres are romance and thrillers. If you want to learn more about Kobo Writing Life or our podcast, check out our blog and find us on social. You can find our podcast on all podcast providers. Are you ready to start your self-publishing journey today? You can create a free account at kobo.com slash writing life. Lindsay Varoka is an award-nominated, internationally best-selling author of epic fantasy, urban fantasy, space opera, steampunk, and sci-fi romance. With 79 books and counting across two pen names, 10 series, as well as standalone and shorter works. She's also the co-host of the Six Figure Author Podcast. Welcome back, Lindsay. Hey, Joanna. Thanks for having me on. I think it's my third time. <laughs> it's good to be here. Good to talk to everyone. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, that is my first question. So the last time you were on was in 2017 when we were in New Orleans and we did our hilarious co-writing project. And before that, it was way back in 2015. So I thought it was about time we did an update. So tell us, just give us a snapshot. What does your author life look like now? And, and what has changed over the last few years? Well, I'm continuing to write a lot. <laughs> As you mentioned, I have a lot of novels out there. I seem to get eight, ten novels out a year, one a month if they're short, but sometimes later in series they go much longer. And I, I'm still writing the kind of stories I love, even if that means genre hopping and maybe you're not quite as efficient <laughs> as if you stuck and focused as far as uh, building a fan base. But I really like to follow my muse and then kind of worry about the marketing afterwards. It's been a couple of years, I think, since I had a big series uh, really stick and do well. And kind of every now and then you get one that stays up there on its own and you're like, well, it's just going to always be like this going forward. But what I've had to realize is like, no, you know, you always have your fans that will follow you along. But some series, you know, hit more to the zeitgeist or whatever than other ones do. And so I know you talk about comparisonitis on the show and comparing yourself with others. I'm kind of at the point 10 years in now where I compare myself a lot with past successes. Uh, and I'm always like, okay, I got to figure out what I can do every year to um, not see the income drop. And I am have fortunately been able to be flexible enough and play with KU when that's a, a thing to do to kind of keep it up there. But I, I, I feel like a lot of authors just think as long as you keep writing more books, you'll make more money every year. And, and that was the trajectory the first five years or so. And then you kind of level off and it's sort of like, and now there's so much more competition and so many books out there. So it's, I, I've just been focusing on doing what I can to keep it the same level. And I don't know, I, every now and then I feel like I should be doing more. There's so much to do. And I'm sure you feel the same way with all your nonfiction and your fiction going on. You know, it's, it's a challenge. It never gets like, you never feel like you can just kick back and, all right, I, I've got a big enough fan base now I can just release the books and do nothing else <laughs> yeah that is true we'll, we'll come back to marketing it's so good that you say that that comparing to past success because I had this you'll laugh at this I had this hilarious tweet yesterday that said how many months did it take you to get known or to get to success and I was like dude it's been like 14 years <laughs> You're like 3.7 months and I was there. <laughs> you can do it too. <laughs> and I was just like, and this is the thing, and I want people to appreciate that you've also been doing this a decade. But scarily, you've been doing this a decade and you have more than twice the number of books I do. So I really, that is one of the questions I wanted to ask you about. Wait, just remind people, how long did that first novel take you? It was about seven years, <laughs> you know, not continuous writing all the time. I kind of wrote it did a workshop, got stuck, hated the ending, let it go for a while. And then I, I'm always inspired by other people's success. So, you know, I kind of got serious about it again and rewrote, completely rewrote the second half of the book and went through a workshop again. And, and that was actually not even my first novel. That was just the first one I finished and published. I had written other stuff and hadn't gone through the polishing stage. So it was not a, I was not on the ground running by any means. <laughs> so that really is the question. And you mentioned on one of your six figure author podcast shows that your productivity really took off when you moved into plotting. So how did you go from one book in seven years to eight to 10 novels a year? So the first series I did uh, was my Emperor's Edge fantasy series. And I, I didn't, outline. I was just a pantser. You know, that's how I enjoyed doing it. 
And I didn't even have like, I've, I've since gone back and looked, I'm like, did I have a story Bible or any notes about like the characters, <laughs> you know, what color hair people have and stuff? It's like, no, there was like three <laughs> sentences in my notes page. I was like, wow, I just thought I would remember everything. And it, it kind of works when you're just on your first series because those characters had been in my head for a long time. But I, you know, I saw other people publishing more quickly. And I, I remember the, it was actually the self-publishing podcast guys for doing five, 6,000 words a day. And I think I, my first goal was a thousand words a day and then 3,000. And then I heard them doing that and I tried to do more. And Rachel Aaron had her 2K to 10K book. And I was like, okay, I can do 10K a day if I, if I really focus and want to. But it helped not just getting the words down, but by outlining. I, it kept me from, it really sped up the editing process. So when I was pantsing it, I'd often kind of get my characters stuck. And then I'd have to like, mm, you know, delete. I had like a whole section of deleted scenes, which is not a thing I have now. The fans are probably sad because I used to share those. But now it's just a lot more efficient because I, what I do is I just outline in chronological order. I don't have any fancy system. We'll kind of lay out the basic framework of the story. I'm not doing dialogue or, you know, too much on theme. That kind of comes to me as I'm writing. So it's just, I know, but the character goes from A to B to C, and then they end up in F, whatever. And that has been helpful for me not getting stuck and having to rewrite scenes. And then, you know, a lot of it's just practice too. Like the first few novels, I think for everybody, you're just, you rewrite them like eight times. It's just, that's how it is. You're still kind of figuring out how to make the sentences the right way, you know, and it's just you're really thinking a lot about it. And if you're doing a workshop, everybody is giving you feedback and you're like, I got to change this and this and this. So outlining has helped. And then, of course, just doing it a lot and making it a habit to work every day. So how, how many hours a day do you write in order to get, say, a novel a month? So, I'll, you know, I'm going anywhere from maybe 6,000 to 10,000 a day when I'm working on a first draft. And I try not to take many days off in there. I tend to take my time off between projects. That's just really how I like to roll. I like everything fresh and still in my mind. It doesn't take long for my brain to forget things. So uh, even if it's a, a longer novel that takes longer, then I start like, what happened in the first three chapters? So I love to get it just down quickly for the first draft. And hours, I can do about 2,000 words an hour when I'm really focused. Sometimes I have to turn off the Wi-Fi so I don't catch myself tabbing over to <laughs> some chat or <laughs> check something on Facebook. But it'll slow down when I'm doing dialogue. That just seems to take a little longer. And then when I'm doing like more action, just it's pretty, you know, here's a fight scene. For me, I write those more quickly. So it, it averages to about 2,000 words an hour. And I, I take a lot of breaks during the day. It's healthy, <laughs> I hear, <laughs> to actually move your legs and butt. And, you know, even if it's just going to do the dishes or something. So it's probably about five hours of writing if I'm on a 10,000 word day. But it can take all day to get there. Sometimes I make it by five, you know, I'll work like nine ish to five breaks in the middle. And I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm really awesome. I can take my evening off. But it's just as common for me to still be working in the evening because I don't know, you let yourself wander off and do whatever. And, and of course, you know how much admin stuff there is, too, especially <laughs> when you're releasing new books. Sometimes when it's kind of later in a series and I'm not releasing anything that month, those would be my most productive months because there's fewer people emailing because whenever you have a new release, you get a lot more email from the readers and less arranging things uh, with the marketing. I, I mostly focus on that for the launch month of a new series and then kind of back off and just do the minimal stuff when I release new installments in the series. I don't know how many, <laughs> did that answer your question in yeah. there somewhere? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And well, I want to come back on plotting because like you said, you do linear plotting, which I, you know, I can, can see works for one book. I think my challenge, like I've just written this book three and it was exactly what you said. I got to this point and I was like, my timeline is just so screwed. And I wish I had had an idea about the end. I didn't even know it was a three book trilogy when I wrote the first book or even the second book. And then the third book, I was like, oh yeah, it's a trilogy and this should have this ending. But boy I'm, I could have made this easier on myself and you write sort of six book eight book series right so how do you plot the series so that it satisfies readers and gets that read through I think the one thing for me is in the beginning I tried to outline like the first three books before I started writing and I found that I changed so much in book one as I was writing that those outlines just were it was wasted time I had to redo them so now I you know, I sort of usually thinking about the next series while I'm still working on the last one. As writers, of course, we have the <laughs> what is it, shiny, shiny object, object or <laughs> squirrels or something running along the trees. I don't know, and that's me. And it's really hard to like 
just put that off. I have to make little notes and start thinking about it, though, and let myself do that while I'm finishing the last thing. And so then I have some ideas when I'm sitting down to finally focus on that one. And I'll outline the first book. But before I even start doing that, I have to know how the series is going to end. It may be kind of nebulous, but You know, I feel like if you know what the final end scene kind of is, which characters are involved, what you want to say in the end. And, you know, there's a lot of it evolves, too. But I I almost always know how the series is going to end when I start. And I find that helps me along the way. So I outline the first one. And then, you know, there may be adventures and side stories that crop up that I get inspired to do that I didn't originally plan. But uh, as long as I know, like, where I'm going... I, I find that I can get there. And that's probably a thing of practice too. You know, my first series though, I, I very much knew how it would end before it began. So I don't know if you did with yours, but I don't know. I think it's really helpful because I feel like sometimes you watch TV series and you can tell, like, it's really interesting. They're opening all these loops. You know, I think Chris Fox was the one that talked about opening loops in a series. And it's like, wow, this is really interesting. But you realize as the final season comes, they didn't have any idea how they were actually going to wrap it up. And it, it ends up making a less satisfying ending that way. Yeah, like they really nail it in the pilot and then it just, yeah, like you say, it kind of fizzles out. But I want, I know many people listening, uh, there still is a kind of debate in the community. I don't know, it's not really a debate, but the, the sort of standalone versus story arc series versus episodic series. And the Career Author Summit, I heard you speak really talking about how the story arc series has readers buying every book, whereas the episodic series, you know, you might not get the, the, such sell through. So could you expand on that? Like, why is a story arc series so much better for that? And why a series in general for those people who just want to write standalones? <laughs> Right. Well, uh, series, obviously, with the marketing, you can afford to spend more on book one if you know you have seven more books and X number of people from your data shows you that they're going to go on and buy it. So that's one point why do a series. And also, if you you kind of know what the read through is, maybe you're getting the five, six in the series, you pretty much know when you launch book seven before you even start writing it you're going to make at least this much money because it's, you know, that's the trend. That's what people have been doing. And that's very comforting and (laughs) helpful if you're trying to become a full-time author and you really don't want such huge swings in your income, you know, like, because a lot of people release a new book and it goes way up and then it sort of plummets (laughs) while you're working on the next book. Fortunately, when you do get more of a backlist, at least I found that right now, like my front list will be about half my income and my backlist will be about half my income in any given year. So that backlist helps keep things steady, but you know, if it's your first series or your second series, that can really give you some confidence to know, okay, I can take three months to work on this next book because I know I'll make this much. So that's my why series. As far as episodic versus sort of the bigger story arc, I just find with my own, you know, and I'm not saying you can't do either. And some genres really lend themselves more strongly to one than the other. You don't see as many of the epic Battlestar Galactica five seasons to get back to Earth stories in uh, mysteries where people expect a complete story in each novel. But I find that with my own series, I've done both episodic and I've done the one, the sci-fi one I'm finishing up this summer. Almost everyone ends on a cliffhanger. Like it's a complete story, but there's obviously something that has to be resolved in the next book. And I've, you know, I did a sell through. It was great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As you would, you know, people might complain like, oh, again, they're captured or kidnapped or whatever again. <laughs> But it works, and that's sort of, you have to balance that as an author. Try to still give a complete installment that feels like a a full novel and doesn't leave people grumpy, and there's a kind of forward progress. But boy, that keeps them reading. And with the episodic stories, you know, like mystery as an example, I feel like most thrillers are also kind of, I've seen some three-book story arcs and stuff, but it's more common, I think, to have a complete story in one. That's not that that can't work. Obviously, it works for lots of people. And if that's what your genre expects, you know, that's fine. But if you can kind of seed in some of the things like with the characters that were, you know, that we want to know more about this character, we're really intrigued by them. I remember reading the Agent Pendergast books. I guess that's more your genre, Impression Child. Yes, I still and, read know, he, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was, so, especially in the early ones, I think he wasn't the POV character, but you were really intrigued by this guy. And that made me, that got me into a genre I don't usually read. I don't want a you know loving detail of smashing kneecaps and some of the things that are common in in thrillers 
but you know, the characters got me and I wanted to know more about this guy. And so if you can sort of have some mysteries with some side characters or something your hero is actively trying to achieve. I used in my talk, I talked about the series Monk from, I guess it's probably been like 15 years ago now, where, where he was a got had to leave the police force because his wife was murdered and each one was an individual episode you know there was a mystery to solve in each one but at the whole series he was trying to find out who murdered his wife and that kept you watching even if the individual stories were wrapped up so i think if you can seed some of that into the episodic series that it just keeps people reading because otherwise if everything is complete at the end of the book you know eh, maybe they'll check out the next one Mm because they like you as an author they like your voice but you know they also feel like oh well that that's done I feel satisfied I can go read something else now yeah it is really interesting because of course in I'm in the thriller genre and actually this was really the first true trilogy I've written and it was yeah as in one character arc completed in a specific way no no spoilers (laughs) but it but most of my thriller stuff is more in the James Bond you know area where each one is its own thing it's just the characters continue between different books but I when you said that at the talk I was like of course it makes more sense that people would go and buy the next one when there is a real cliffhanger and I think you're right about fantasy like my husband will get one of those 12 book audiobook series and will basically spend four months listening to these <laughs> like 4,000 hours of fantasy series <laughs> Do you have to listen to it with him or his oh, no. son? <laughs> God, no. <laughs> no, but it is, it is interesting that, and I did want to ask you about characters because you've written, okay, so you've written, let's say, so 79 books and they, these are all fiction, right? All your, you've only written fiction. Right. Yeah. yeah. So <sighs> creating characters. So we have these characters that are sort of main characters, but then we also creating these casts of other characters per books, per series. What are your tips for creating original characters that are not cardboard cutout plot devices? Or is originality overrated when you have that many books? So I think that for one thing, it's it's after a while, one of the challenges I find is that they all kind of have my sense of humor. So it's a little hard to make them original from each other because they're all, especially the main characters tend to be a little bit of me. So that's certainly a challenge. And then I find that giving them really defined goals in life. I almost always, when I start a series, it starts with the character and what they want to achieve versus uh, thinking of the plot first and then putting the characters in it. And I think that makes it easier to give a really character-driven story. You know, I, I love to give them like unique quirks too. I have one of my pilots, he's like this, you know, tough guy, really, uh, really capable, has shot down all these enemies in his little biplane. But he's like super superstitious and he has this little wooden dragon figurine that he kisses every time before he goes into danger. And it's just the kind of thing that, you know, makes that character memorable. A a side character in the current series I'm doing, it's a contemporary fantasy. You know, she's from Thailand and she came to America to, uh, you know, pursue the American dream and she started a food truck and actually she makes magical weapons on the side, which is common, of course, uh, when you come to America. (laughs) But her goal is like her family's poor and she wants to bring them over. And so her complete goal and everything that drives her is she wants to be able to buy a house and just bring everybody over. So that really gives her just everything is about that for her. And it really helped define that character. So and sometimes, too, with characters, I will not always, but I, there, I'll have some like actor or character in another show in mind. The pilot I mentioned was very much inspired by Stargate SG-1's Colonel O'Neill, and I could just kind of see his face and his sarcasm. And here I bring it into a fantasy world, and it becomes my own character eventually, but sometimes it can be helpful. You know, authors are always supposed to say, this is not resembling any person, real or fictional. <laughs> you know, and It's like, <laughs> such a lie. It's so much easier if you kind of have, if it, at least the inspiration was a real person, and they're kind of quirky too. They can kind of bring that in. But just interesting traits and goals, I think, really helps... Uh, distinguish them from other characters you've written or other characters that are common archetypes in the genre Mm. and I think that so if we combine archetype with the genre so for example in my thrillers you know it really is stopping the bad guy and saving the world I mean that is the goal (laughs) for for every book and you know often like you said about the space it's getting home or saving the planet or whatever so often the goal if you write a lot of books in the same genre the goal is the same but you talk there about the girl who wants to buy a house so but does she also have another goal around saving the planet or something 
Well, she's kind of the side character, but so she doesn't have to save the planet. Oh, okay. The hero has to do that. <laughs> but a lot of times, too, when you have those kind of characters, right, they're driven. Why are they driven to do this? Was there something in their background? Did they come from a single parent family? And, you know, they want to make a better world for, you know, uh, kids growing up today or something in their past, they were bullied. And so now they want to fight justice. And that's kind of background, you know, knowing that background can help define them. Because I think when you get a character that just saves the world and you're like, why are you doing this? Because most of us (laughs) want to save ourselves. You know, we're inherently selfish. So there has to be some, you know, even altruism, usually you're doing, you're giving to charity to feel good about yourself, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So there, I think the characters are more honest if, you really flesh out why this person is driven to do that. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. So I want to ask you about your pen name. I know we're jumping around and the listeners, I'm sure, also are appreciating all these because you, you do so much and I think it's interesting. But you started this pen name a few years back now and it is difficult to have a pen name. You know, I have mainly Joanna Penn and JF Penn and it's blooming hard to manage two brands. So why did you start a pen name and any lessons learned for anyone else considering it? It is very hard to do too. And for people who aren't as drastically different as you are with the nonfiction and the fiction, I'm kind of like, are you sure? Are you really sure you want to do this? Because that's what I found is like, you can start one, you have all this enthusiasm and, you know, you start a new series maybe with that pen name. Uh, And the reason I did is that it was sort of the sex scenes versus more PG stuff that my fans were uh, used to from me. So I, I went and did sci-fi romance with the pen name and had all the naughty bits on the page. And it was definitely a lot more graphic. And some of my fans were like, that's cool. We want it all. And others were like, oh, yeah, I don't want to read that. So that's good that you started the pen name. But you do have to do, you know, the marketing. I had the social media for a while. I've since kind of let it go follow. And if I started writing more series again, I'll have to rev everything up. You know, you start a mailing list for the pen name books. So there's a lot you have to do. It's hard enough to do it all with one person. So you have to think about, do you really want to do that just to like play with the algorithms, you know, Mm. and hope your also bots aren't polluted? I've given up on this point on that because I I write all over the place within sci-fi and fantasy. And it's, you know, that's just how it is. There's going to be spaceship books in my urban fantasy series in the also bots because that's what I wrote last. Would you do it? Again, or, or I mean, you could fix this now in that Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Marsh are good examples, right? They now have everything under one name. It's just, it's very obvious by the covers. And your your Ruby covers are obviously different to your spaceship covers. So, you know, what are your thoughts on it now? If, do, if you were going to do it now or if you were going to fix it, would you put it all under one name? I'm not sure because I have thought about that. I'm like, well, I'd sell a lot more of these books if I just claimed them under both names and had them on Amazon and easily findable. But they are enough racier. I mean, real romance authors and erotic authors would be like, oh, my gosh, that's not racy at all. But, you know, they're so enough different from my usual you know, I even have a threesome book, which is uh, quite risque for me <laughs> under Ruby. And it's like, uh, I'm not sure. So I don't know. Maybe someday I will because it would I'd sell more of those if because right now I tend to forget about them because it's been a couple of years since I did a new one. So I've considered it. It's not quite as drastic as like writing children's fiction and erotic. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's not that big of a gap. So it's it's something I'm thinking about. There's always I'm always debating things, you know, <laughs> like yeah. any good entrepreneur, you know, like, should I do this or will I risk alienating people? So you have to decide. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think this is for people listening. This is a really big deal. So many people creating so many pen names and yet also listening to Dean and Chris, who say that's what they had to do out of traditional publishing and they don't believe it should be done. And yes, we have the algorithms, but let's face it, the way things are now, there are lots of ways to do series-specific marketing and stuff like that. So I don't know. Also, I'm kind of torn. I'm quite happy with the way I've done things. But on JF Pen, I'm thinking about doing some nonfiction under JF Pen. And also I write across many subgenres. So it is interesting. I mean, that's changed, I think, in the last five years that it used to be, yes, definitely you should have an, another name. It didn't used to be that you had to build this giant platform yeah. and interact with the readers and everything too and have all these mailing lists. So I think actually what would change my mind is if Amazon with the Kindle Unlimited program, because my pen name's all in KU, I just wanted to keep it simpler. So that's exclusive, whereas I'm wide with a lot of stuff under my regular name. But I usually have the most recent couple series that I launch under my name in KU. 
And if they, like right now, the way they have it is if it's something's co-authored, like if I put Lindsay Baroker and Ruby Lyons Drake, that would be a different entity as far as counting page reads and getting bonuses and things. So if, but if it all counted together, I'd be a little more tempted, but as it is now, I'd have to take Ruby's name off completely as an author. Mm. If I wanted to like add credit that and, you know, I, I usually get like the bottom bonus now, occasionally I've gotten up higher, but it's like, Hmm, if I had more books in KU and could, you know, get more page reads under that name, mm. you know, I don't know. It's just something to think about. And I mean, certainly Dean and Chris have done that is republish old work under their actual names. Well, let's talk about the publishing process because you have a, as you mentioned there, you have a mix, but you also have Patreon. So what is your publishing process uh, looking like at the moment? So right now, and it's always a challenge, I know you're wide with uh, most stuff, and I also do not care to be exclusive and completely reliant on one platform. But at the same time, Amazon is the big, <laughs> the, you want to be aligned with them rather than against them, ideally, because they're just such a behemoth and you need to get so many sales from them. And I found it was harder to launch and kind of stick and keep something selling when I wasn't in KU. So I think 2016, my Fallen Empire series was the first thing. It was my, I was moved into sci-fi and I also launched my first thing into KU exclusive with Amazon for, I did it for about a year, uh, as long as it took to finish the series. And that's kind of still what I'm doing. I definitely did get some pushback from my readers on the other platforms. Because, you know, when we started 10 years ago, mm. <laughs> KU and KDP Select weren't even things. So I started building a fan base everywhere. And Patreon was a way for me to, what I do there is I release the arcs about two weeks early uh, in EPUB and Mobi. So at least that's an option for people who are on Kobo or Barnes & Noble and are frustrated that they have to wait for the series understandably so, I would be too. So, you know, there's more steps, so not everybody's going to be willing to do it, you know, download from BookFunnel and load it onto your e-reader. People tend to want to just to appear. But there are some people that do that and they get the books early. And I, you know, if I publish a short story or something, I'll give it to them first. So that's sort of become the, the place where people can get everything early. And I don't do extra content there. I don't necessarily, or I don't at all do like, patreon only stories because i didn't want it to be a whole bunch of extra work mm. you know and i never i every now and then i remind people it exists i don't promote it a whole bunch i think i've got about 350 people on there it's a good amount of people and it's something where if anything ever happened i could always ramp that up you know and really put the focus there like if amazon said hey today we're only getting 30 percent you know for books <laughs> instead of 70 percent then i could look at that because i'm getting more than 90 percent that way so that is what I'm doing now. New series into KU to take advantage of how much easier it is to get borrows and sales and how that kind of helps with visibility and sticking a little bit longer before books fall off into the tens of thousands of rankings or you know, hundreds of thousands of rankings. I don't know. There's millions now in the store too. So I've just found it's easier. All the marketing you do in KU, especially like Amazon ads, it's just everything seems to be more effective. Uh, you know, it's so expensive, the Amazon ads, but if you're also getting the page reads and the sales, it seems to make it easier to um, come out on top with that money that you're spending there. Mm. Well, let's talk about that then, because uh, marketing is the other side of things. Clearly, you are being prolific. <laughs> So let's just say writing and releasing novels regularly is a good idea. So what are you doing in terms of other marketing? You've mentioned Amazon ads or and also emails. Is that the main thing? So I do Amazon ads. I've kind of reluctantly, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> oh, spending yes. money there every month. I used to just do it around the launch. And now I'm like, you know, last year I did a couple box sets that were in KU and it made sense to um, spend quite a bit. I was spending like a hundred dollars a day on one box set, but it ended up making like 20,000 that month. So it totally made sense to spend that much then, but I'm always a little bit reluctant because I'm not doing Amazon ads like in the UK, Amazon or the other stores yet. And it's just, it's not that I'm against it, but I'm like, well, my income, really hasn't dropped off at all there so it's like I've kind of just built a fan base by publishing so much for for long enough now and I still have a lot of book one frees in the series that are not in KU and that tends to help you know everything the new releases help sell the old stuff so I'm not completely you know I'm not a super fan of Amazon ads I use them I'm 
make sure it's usually a pretty small percentage. I try to keep it around five, maybe 10% of total income in a, in a launch month. And I'm just trying to get people to get invested in a new series. I tinker with Facebook ads on and off, tinker with BookBub, the mm. pay-per-click ads on and off. I haven't really done more. I still do rely, you know, regularly the sponsorship, you know, I'll run, especially on my backlist. That's what I tend to do is, uh, you know, every once or twice a year, I'll make something free if it's not already free or I'll drop the price or make the box set free uh, that leads into the rest of the series. And I'll try to get, I'll try to always get a book by bad. Sometimes I can, sometimes not easier with wide books, you know, and then the kind of bargain booksy or free booksy. You know, I still use those guys because I feel like, you get a lot of downloads for the money compared mm. to if you're paying per click on a free book, you know, it really takes a lot to get like 200 downloads. Yeah. Whereas, you know, no, over know. here I can get a couple thousand and maybe the people are more likely to read through that you're getting on Amazon through AMS ads. But I feel that, you know, I get a nice little bump every time I run those uh, and people reading through the, to the whole series. And it, it kind of helps if you have a book one that ends as we were talking about <laughs> yeah. in like not very complete and wrapped up, but with a lot more questions. So that's still effective for me, especially on the other platforms, kind of having a free book one. And I kind of cycle around. I have a couple that are just always free. I, they've been on like Wattpad and Scribd and everything. It would be a real pain in the butt now to go yank it down everywhere to charge money for it. But then I kind of cycle with the other stuff. And, you know, every time something's been $4.99 for a while, then all of a sudden it's free. You know, it gets like a fresh boost just from that. So I, I kind of just experimenting, doing all the things. I don't feel like I'm particularly good at like writing ad copy or you know getting the best <laughs> conversion on a, those Amazon ads. So and I'm I'm just I, every time I launch a new series, it's a new chance to like, well, let's try this. You know, I got some tips from this interview with um David Gogren and, and Mark Dawson and. <laughs> You know, I signed up for the webinar as we're recording this. You just had mentioned on a future podcast that Mark had a webinar. So I'm like, all right, let me see what I can learn this time. And, you know, I always try, but I'm not a real natural at the marketing and copywriting, probably as many authors. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that writing pretty quickly is a way of marketing in itself. You know, so yeah. that is. Well, I think awesome. this is really important for people listening. I hope people realize you are writing this many books per year, you have 79 books. And yet what you're doing with marketing is you're continuing to do marketing. So it's not like you just put the books up there and leave them. And I, I sometimes feel like sometimes people think if you have a lot of books, then that will just they'll just sell themselves. But what you're talking about is essentially cycling through these series, making sure presumably pretty much all the time something is being promoted on some platform. You know, probably every month almost I'm like, okay, I haven't done this one for a while. Let's see if I can get some promos for this book one and, and try to get some new people into that. I, I do feel that same way too. Like I, somebody was talking to the, someone and they were asking, because it's been more competitive, right? These last few years are like, are you, a lot of people are making less than they used to. Oh yeah. And, and they're mm -hmm. like, well, well, you're writing more books and you're not making more. I'm like, well, I'm staying at the same point. So that's not too bad because it's a really good place. Um, so I'm happy to be there and grateful for the readers that help keep me at that point. But I feel like it's still, it's really like any other job where you just, you have to keep working and then you take some of the money you make and you put it in investments, you know, so that, you know, someday you can retire if you want to. Maybe you don't want to retire fully, but maybe you want to work less later on. And so that's something you can work towards. So, but it's, yeah, it's not like if that was true, publishers wouldn't have to publish any more books, right? Because they've got tens of thousands of titles in their catalog. They'd just be pocketing billions of dollars every year, but that's not really how it works. It's always easier to sell the new stuff. And, you know, you have to keep working to keep the backlist selling. And hopefully if your new stuff is good enough, you know, it brings readers to try the older books. So I, I'm okay with how it is right now. If it, can, if it can keep it at that level, I think I'm doing pretty good. But it is very hard to continuously keep it in an upward trajectory. Yeah, I agree. And I think you're, and I actually think it was the advent of KU where, I mean, some people made more money the first couple of years of KU, but certainly those of us who weren't in KU saw a big drop that year. And a lot of us who are wide saw that drop. And, but as you say, this is the reality of, of a lot of the market. So perhaps it's just, as you say, there are more people, but also I think it's a lot to do with the US market being saturated. And what I'd encourage people to think is the rest of the world, it's really not got going yet and what's kind of exciting as excited as you can be about the 
pandemic <laughs> is um, <laughs> that places like France and Italy and Spain and, you know, these different markets that have been really resistant to digital suddenly picking up because so many readers have had to go digital during this time. So it may be that we're gifted with a massive influx of new readers from all over the world after this period and that that bringing in new readers actually ref almost refreshes the audience as such. That, that might happen. I think so, because I feel like once you go e-reader, you tend not to go back. I was that way when I first got my Kindle. I was like, I'm only going to use this when I travel. You know, mm. it's handy for traveling. I don't have to take five books with me on an airplane. You know, and now I'm like hardly ever buy anything. You know, sometimes some nice nonfiction books that I want for my shelf, I'll buy physically. But almost everything I just buy on the Kindle. So we'll see. I think that it may help turn some of those people that were like, no, I like the smell of pages <laughs> into <laughs> e-reader fans. <laughs> And we are positioned pretty well. We have been with the pandemic a lot better than a lot of industries. You know, I, I haven't seen my income go down, even though like the new series that I was hoping would be do really well just has done OK. I feel like my backlist has really been selling well. So I don't know if that's just a reflection of more people reading or some of those box sets I did last year that sold a lot or had a lot of KU reads kind of have directed people into my other stuff. So I feel really fortunate, you know, that we can be as super flexible with the pricing too. I don't know if traditional publishing is going to start, you know, they run sales, of course, they do the book bubs and you'll see their stuff for $1.99. But right now, as we're recording this, they still seem to like their $14.99 ebooks and $9.99 ebooks. So that's our kind of been our advantage all along is that we can make really good money on a $3.99 or a $4.99 ebook. Mm, no, absolutely. So, I mean, you and I met on Twitter like a decade ago. And in fact, you, you still use the same picture on your Skype that I'm looking at right now. <laughs> Your little goblin. I use Skype once a year, yeah, my little goblin. <laughs> yeah, once a year. And, and it's funny, I mean, there aren't too many of us, I think, who've been around so long. And I, I tend to think that you and I will still be around in another decade. I, I mean, we, we don't show any signs of doing much else. <laughs> so what do you think we'll see? Any thoughts on what you're excited about or what is going to change? And how, how are we going to make it another decade? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know what else I would do for a living. So <laughs> it just like really suits me that I can write my books from my home, do my uh, marketing online on my computer. I don't have to talk to anyone <laughs> except the very occasional podcast talk. So it's great. It would be, I mean, I feel like there are other things I could do. I've learned enough about internet marketing. To yeah, so exactly. Books, you know? <laughs> but I, you know, this is great. It's sort of always been my dream job to um, write my own story. So I will continue doing that. What will the next decade bring? You know, it's, I'm horrible at prediction stuff, but I think that, I don't know, I feel like we might see something push back to the PPC ads. I feel like it's so hard already right now to really make that work since ebooks are so inexpensive. You, you kind of almost need a series or you need a book that you're selling for nine ninety nine, you know, a box set or something. So I, I don't know if we'll see pushback with that or if maybe readers on Amazon might start to get banner blind to that stuff and they just will be less effective and there'll be some new thing that comes along. Or it's also possible. I've never forgotten early on in my when I started publishing books, I came across Kevin Kelly's article on 1,000 True Fans and the concept of just kind of building your tribe one person at a time. And if you could get that many people, you know, and some of them will tell other people and you'll have less, you know, casual fans too. But I, I feel like that was very important to me in the beginning. And I feel like sometimes we lose track of that with all, we're always trying to get new readers mm. by all this advertising on Amazon. And I see people sometimes kind of lose focus of the fans they already have. And I try to not let myself do that. Like I just sent out a bunch of um, bonus scenes and a free short story with the new series I'm doing. And somebody emailed back and they were like, wow, that's so awesome. No author has ever sent me a free ebook. And I was like, really? <laughs> well, you get on some more email lists. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're thinking, you know, traditionally published and stuff. But I think even they'll have to do it. You know, really kind of cultivating the people that you can get and making sure to continue to make them feel like they're your best customers. They're sort of the proven people that go out and buy your book at new releases. And it's it's a little less daunting, too, I think, if you're just thinking, all right, I'm just kind of one fan at a time. I'm going to build a fan base and I'm going to treat them really well instead of always just... And, you know, you always have to try to get new people into because things happen, you know, mm. people pass away or people's tastes change. But I think if you really focus on 
giving a lot to the people who really have proven that they love you and they love, well, they love your books anyway, but enough <laughs> yeah. they love me personally, you know, that I think that's going to have to be the focus as it continues to be more competitive as these AIs you're talking about start writing uh, thrillers and uh, epic fantasy, you know, really connecting with your people by giving them what they love and, I don't necessarily share a lot personally about what I'm doing. Every now and then again, they get a dog picture or something, but I just try to give them the stories that they enjoy. So I think that's what we're going to have to do going forward. It's probably only, only going to get more competitive, but your people that really love your voice and the way you write, and they're very maybe similar taste to you, they're out there. You just you have to do all this other stuff to find them. But once you find them, nurturing them and trying to keep them on board, I think that that's always going to be the way to have a solid career and to know that you have somebody to buy the next book that you put out. Yeah, I think you're right. And as you said, when we started a decade ago, that kind of personal brand and building it up slowly was the thing. And I mean, maybe and a lot of us have been talking about selling direct and Patreon as part of that. And, you know, we can do audio now with through Find Your Way Voices and stuff like that. So I agree. I think there'll be more and more development of direct channels to customers that bypass the various platforms and that will build the brand. It gives us more revenue. Um, but but there will be no vanity metrics. <laughs> so you won't make bestseller lists if you're just selling direct, but you'll have a lot more money in your pocket and you'll satisfy your fans. So it is definitely interesting, but I, I agree with you. I think that is a big thing. And just before we go, so we're almost out of time, but uh, I wanted to just ask you quickly about the Six Figure Author podcast. Uh, I wanted to direct people to that. So because clearly you sp spend most of your time writing and doing your fiction, how does the podcast fit into your author career? It's just something since the beginning I've really liked kind of, I don't know, you call it giving back or teaching or just sharing what you're learning. And sometimes you learn things better yourself too when you start to teach and articulate to others. So, and, you know, we talked about before hitting record that we like interviewing people who know more than we do, especially <laughs> in certain areas, because we can ask them all the questions we want to ask them. So it's a way to sort of a little bit networking. It's easier to ask later if you're, you know, you're known, like in the self-publishing industry, it's probably easier for me to go out and say like, hey, anybody want to promote my new release? And I'll, you know, I'll do the same too. I don't do a lot of that because I don't, I'm not that crazy on the newsletter swaps and, and that sort of thing. Not that they don't work. It's just not something I enjoy, but it's easier if you kind of have a voice and you've been helping people, people want to help you. So there's that aspect of it. And then there's just, if you have like videos or blog posts you've done, I, I used to blog. I kind of dropped that off when I started doing the podcast. You know, you're kind of mm. saying everything you have to say every week. It's hard to come up with blog posts too. But then when people email, email and ask for questions, you know, ask questions, which I know you get more than I do because you're even more out there uh, with the podcasting and all the nonfiction books, then you, you know, you just like, well, hey, I already answered this question in this episode. Please go check it out. Everything I have to say is on that. So it's a way to talk to a lot of people and help more people versus just email. So one-on-one -on -one, and it takes a lot of time to do those one-on-one -on -one exchanges and nobody else gets the same answer you know the benefit of that answer unless you go make a blog post out of it or something so it's just something I enjoy doing for now I don't know if I'll always do it because it's not super doesn't really tie into me t selling my fiction but it's something that I, I like being a part of the community in a small way since you know when you work from home Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see people especially right now yeah. <laughs> you don't get to go like to the Starbucks or whatever yeah, so it's a way to at least kind of establish relationships within among your peers that otherwise wouldn't know you that it, you exist. Yeah, and also I know you're an introvert and I'm an introvert, and it was hilarious when all the introverts went to New Orleans. <laughs> But, you know, we, we manage, but it's also another way for people like us to actually have conversations and make friends without actually having to spend much time together. <laughs> Yes, definitely. I, you know, and I've met so many people, you know, I, I do go to a couple conferences a year usually, and I listen to everybody's podcasts. And I've kind of seen as a listener of podcasts, how much it makes you want to support that person, and how much more likely you are to like mention them versus somebody else if, you know, if somebody asks your recommendation. So I, I certainly see the value of it for many, there's many things, you know, many, many reasons to do it if you're interested in it. And many kind of intangible benefits. Mm, definitely. So that is the six figure author. Where else can people find you and your books online? 
If you just uh, Google Lindsay Broker, my website will come up. Or if you're an Amazon person, everything's there. I'm on the other bookstores with most of my series too. So that's about it. Twitter and Facebook are the two social medias I actually regularly <laughs> do. Although I don't post anything on my personal Facebook. It's like I do the author page because that actually sells books. Yeah. And that uh, lets me communicate with the readers and uh, keep them informed. But my own personal updates are like three times a year. I don't know. So I, I might not respond to a friend request because I just, I don't really use that side of it. But no, I don't I, either. I don't <laughs> <laughs> like the feeling. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Well, thanks so much, Lindsay. That was fantastic. All right. Thanks for having me and happy writing, everybody. So I hope you found the interview with Lindsay interesting and it gave you some ideas for your writing life. I also recommend you check out the Six Figure Author podcast with Lindsay, Andrea Pearson and Joe Lalo. It's definitely one of my regular listens. I'm also reflecting on A Thousand True Fans, which Lindsay mentioned, and really trying to narrow my focus rather than try to compete in the mainstream. I think that's the real power of being independent. We can play a different game. We do not need to play the same game and compete in the same area as the traditional publishers. I think it's almost can make you feel bad if you try and do that, whereas you can really win if you play your own game in your corner of the field. (laughs) So I'm really thinking about this at the moment. I shall make my thoughts more coherent at some point. I also want to pick up on what Lindsay said about this being a job like any other, and you have to take some of your income and invest it for the longer term. And she and I have talked about this uh, when we've met up in person and we both invest money in different things as we would if we had a normal day job. And if you want more detail on what I do, check out episode 469 with Brad Barrett on FIRE, Financial Independence Retire Early, and also my interview on the Choose FI podcast episode 181 where I talk a lot more about money. I don't often talk about it on this show because I feel like it's one of those emotional topics and I'm not a financial advisor or anything like that so clearly I'm not going to it but what Lindsay said there it's so important and I feel like yes you have to sort out your cash flow first and make sure you're making enough money but at some point you have to put a percentage of that profit into investments for the future especially if this is your full-time job like it is for me and Lindsay. Okay, so next week I have an interview with Nick Thacker about action adventure, a genre I obviously love because I write in it with my arcane thrillers and I also love to read. We're also talking about systems thinking because Nick has a hundred year plan. (laughs) No, I thought long term. Nick thinks clearly longer. It's a little bit extreme, but I do like the approach. We talk about pricing higher because Nick does price his books higher, uh, hybrid publishing and building a huge email list to drive book marketing. So that will be next week. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect